We're going to begin the, uh, the, the Newman part two uh, of, 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 of the talk. So uh, if you think of it, it's the end of the day, uh, you might be a little tired, a little overwhelmed. And if, what do you want to learn about the most? And well, it's Austrian capital theory, of course, right? This is, this is why we're all here. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about in this uh, lecture is capital theory. Something that's not really discussed a lot in uh, economics, but what capital theory is, is it's the, you can kind of define it as the study of mankind's network of produced inputs and what causes this network, or as we'll really see a structure, to change. All right, it's the study, it's the theory of capital goods. Okay, and in learning about capital theory, we're going to understand the importance of time in production, the importance of savings, right, specificity, Right, so the, the uniqueness of different capital goods we'll talk about, and what's known as roundaboutness. Right? Capital theory uh, has a very time-honored place in Austrian economics. The, the earliest Austrians, Karl Menger, and his uh, disciple, Eugen von Bombewerk, right, uh, were very uh, big into, uh, very interested in capital theory. Uh, Bombewerk wrote this, uh, this, this massive uh, work called Capital and Interest, it really influenced Mises. It's one of the great treatises of Austrian economics, right? You've got capital interest, you've got human action, man, economy, and state, et cetera. So it's important that as, as Austrian students of the Austrian school, we understand what capital theory is, uh, especially because, as I mentioned earlier, capital theory is neglected in modern economics. Uh, time in the uh, heterogeneity of capital goods are unimportant. It's like, well, you don't really need to look at capital goods. We can kind of lump them all together. Uh, we just focus on labor markets, et cetera. Uh, I'll be going through the differences between the Austrian and the neoclassical approach to capital theory later on in the talk, but it's just something to mention to keep at the back of your mind uh, throughout this entire time that this is really a lot, some of the most of the money in banking stuff I was going through, a good amount of it, you know, you learn about balance sheets and all of that in your uh, traditional money in banking course, but you're, you're not going to, you're not going to learn this in any standard uh, economics curriculum, right? Capital theory is 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 completely absent. Okay. All right. Well, before getting into capital theory and capital goods, I, I just want to mention that capital goods, in, in a profound sense, is is what makes humans unique. Okay. It's what makes humans different. All right. Uh, our standards of living have risen from the primitive level to our sophisticated uh, modern level because humans, we've devised an increasingly intricate edifice of capital goods. We've just had more and more stuff, right? We started off from a hut, then we go to a medieval house, right, with a fireplace, then we go to a modern house and well, eventually we'll get to the Jetsons, we'll have our flying cars and you know the, 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 all the buildings high in the sky. I, Estimate this will take, it will, we'll be there in about two to three years. Um, you know, beavers, they're still making dams, but humans have moved past huts, right? We were constantly uh, evolving by creating better and better tools and, and better stuff, all right? So we want to look at this, this structure because uh, when we buy a good from the store, it's a consumer good, we buy bread at the grocery store. We don't think about the fact that the bread just wasn't transformed, uh, you know, created instantaneously and just from raw ingredients. There's this entire complex structure of production of all these capital goods uh, that had to have been made in order to make the bread, all right? So I've been talking about capital goods. It's important to know what exactly are capital goods, all right? Uh, well, what exactly are factors of production, et cetera? This is basic uh, Mengarian economics. I know it's been described, but we just, just want to go through this again. Uh, we know from praxeology that humans act. You know, they use means to achieve ends, right? So if, let's say you're hungry. Right? You have an end. You want to uh, feel satiated. You want to feel full. So you buy food at the grocery store. Then you make a sandwich. And then finally, you eat the sandwich, right? Uh, so the finished good is known as a good of the first order. It's a, it's a consumer good. It can satisfy our ends, right? So the finished sandwich eaten at the, uh, let's say, in front, of, in front of the television, right, that's the consumer good, right? Of course, that consumer good had to have been made, right? That first order good uh, was previously a second order good. So the sandwich made in the kitchen is a good of the second order, 
right? So there's a production process that goes into making the sandwich. You got to combine the bread and the meat and the cheese. Uh, you know, that's what they did with Jersey Mike's, uh, with the sandwiches we had. Um, and uh, you put it on a plate, and then you, you, know, you, you walk back to your, your, your couch, et cetera. And of course, in order to get those ingredients in the kitchen, uh, you had to have bought them at the grocery store. So the purchased ingredients are goods of the third order, et cetera. So the second to the nth order goods are known as higher order goods, right? The good of the third order produces the good of the second order. The good of the second order produces the good of the first order. And then we consume the good of the first order, right? Higher order goods produce goods of a lower order, right? Or lower orders. These lower order goods produce a consumer good, right? So just from a very simple, uh, you never think about this, right? Your average person to make a sandwich, they don't think about this, but now the next time you make a sandwich, you can say, all right, what's the structure of production? What's the first order good, the second order good, right? Uh, and all your friends can kind of look at you weird. They're like, what is, what is he doing? Why is he mumbling to himself? Uh, you say, no, I, this, is, this is Austrian economics, right? Uh, but you know that there's this complicated structure of production behind each and every consumer good, all right? There's all of these higher order factors of production. There are really four factors of production for, at least we can, we can describe here. Right? You've got the labor, right, to make the sandwich. You, you, you know, humans, uh, these are you know, produced by other humans, right? Uh, we can leave it at that. Uh, you've got land. Right? You've got these nature-given resources in the space we stand on, right? So, if, you know, initially the, the food we ate had to have been grown uh, on, in, in, in the ground, right? Uh, the, when we make the food, we have to be standing in a particular place, et cetera. That's what we call land, right? And then there's the capital goods. These are the produced materials made from labor, uh, land, and other capital goods, right? These are all the tools and all of the stuff. This is, again, what makes humans uh, unique, right? And we can split up capital goods so we have a clear idea of, of what I'm getting at. You've got the circulating capital, these are the raw materials turned into another capital good or another circulating capital good or a consumer good, right? The uh, sandwich, the bread used to be flour, right? The flour, the, the, the bread uh, that you use to make the sandwich, those are circulating, ca circulating capital goods, right? Just like the cow that is turned into the roast beef that you put on uh, your sandwich, right? You've also got fixed capital goods, right? These fixed capital goods, these are the tools that, uh, are, you know, are used to transform the circulating capital goods, right? In order to make the sandwich, you have to use a knife. Right? You're not going to eat the knife. At least I, I, I don't advise, advise you to, but, you know, it's a free country. Uh, but, you know, you are going to use the knife to cut the sandwich or to spread the mayonnaise or the mustard on the bread, uh, et cetera, okay? We're really going to be concentrating on capital goods in, in, in this talk. And then you've got technology, recipe. You have to know how to make a sandwich, Right, uh, a certain way, you get a triangle, cut it, you're going to cut it, you know, rectangle, of course you can do triangle, uh, where are you going to put the seasoning, you know, you can put the oregano, right, you got to put oregano on your sandwich, et cetera. There's a lot of stuff that goes into this. I can talk about it after. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, just a couple more points just want to mention. Uh, land and labor are what are called, or they're what's known as the original factors of production, right, because that's what you start off with. As we'll see, every capital good initially, you know, can, can be, uh, you, you can think about it. Initially, every, every capital good had to be created from nature, right, in human effort. The civilization we live in, uh, the, the building that I'm, I'm giving this talk in and we're, we're spending the week in, you know, is eventually all just, just natural resources, right, uh, in, a, in a very profound sense when you think about it. Uh, a more advanced talk would distinguish a little bit more between land and capital goods. We don't really have time to do so. So we're just going to consider land as nature, nature-given resources, et cetera. Uh, there's also a difference between capital and capital goods, right? Sometimes economists will, it, it can be confusing. We mentioned, we say, oh, the structure of capital or the capital structure. We're really referring to the capital goods structure. Capital goods are the produced factors of production. Capital is really the monetary value of those factors of production, okay? Uh, economists will sometimes use them interchangeably when they're really uh, referring to capital goods, but it can be, it can be confusing. They are, they are separate, right? Uh, so I'll, I'll even do this, but that's just important to note. And another thing that's important to note is that factors of production, especially capital goods, differ in terms of their specificity. They are heterogeneous, right? The, uh, there's only, if you want to make a turkey sandwich, well, then you're not going to use roast beef, 
right? Roast beef can only be used to make a roast beef sandwich, right? There's going to be uh, you know, knives. Certain knives are going to be better at cutting bread than other, than the other things. You can use, you know, one knife to cut bread. You're going to need another knife to convert the cow into roast beef, you know, or the, the, et cetera, uh, and, and so on, right? Um, they, they differ in terms of their specificity, right? Certain people are going to be really good at making sandwiches and food. They're going to be chefs, et cetera. Others are not, right? All factors of production have varying degrees of specificity, okay? So to summarize, what we know, what we, what we know just from our simple example is that in a production process, actors use technological knowledge and they apply original factors in uh, fixed capital goods to transform circulating capital goods into consumer goods, right? You make the sandwich, you got to use your knowledge of how to make a sandwich, you got to use your labor, you got to stand somewhere in the kitchen, you got to use your tools, uh, you know, your toaster, your knife, uh, et cetera, and you got to use the circulating capital, the food you bought at the grocery store, and at about, you know, 10, 15 minutes, you're going to make a sandwich, right? And then you can enjoy that sandwich and eat it, okay? So uh, let's explore the creation of capital goods more. And in order to do so, we're going to be using the Robinson Crusoe economics, right? So this comes from a, a, a story written by Daniel Defoe in the 1700s about a man who's, 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 who's stuck on an island. The ship crashes, and he's, he's got some, some, some goods with him, and he's got to sort of remake his life. Uh, more modern version is Tom Hanks uh, in Castaway, if you've ever seen that. Uh, so the, the Hanksian economics hasn't caught on. So that's why we stick to Robinson Crusoe economics. And then here's, a, here's a, uh, the, the, uh, an, an updated version of Robinson Crusoe. So uh, a couple years ago, I was asked to do some modeling for the cover of a Robinson Crusoe book. <laughs> so I got my dog. You know, I didn't shave for a couple of weeks. I did Harry. And I was like, well, you know, I've been working out. So anyway, this is, this is, this is, this is what you see. You know, so that's, that's Robinson Crusoe. Um, <laughs> I think we look identical. But anyway, all right. So Robinson Crusoe, he's, he's stuck on an island. He's got some supplies from his ship. Uh, and, you know, he's got to figure out what he's going to do, right? So the first thing he's got to take care of is he's got to satisfy his end that he's hungry, right? He wants to feel satiated, right? He wants to get food in him. So he can satisfy this end by sort of searching around the island and, and picking berries, right? And he's going to eat these berries. He's going to, it takes time to figure out, okay, where are the berries located, which berries are good, which berries are bad, et cetera. And let's say each day for him to get enough berries to uh, survive, he's going to have to spend uh, 10 hours searching for berries, right? This is the period of production. It's the time it takes from the, uh, the beginning of the production process to when the actor uh, has the consumer goods right, that he can consume. Right? So it takes 10 hours, and then let's say the rest of the day he's got to, you know, he's got to sleep, he's exhausted, he might have to do some other things. Uh, again, just part of his uh, gather you know, wood for his fire or whatever. But you know, 10 hours for food, that, 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 that's a while. It's not exactly like eating berries uh, is, is, a, is, a good, is a good nutritional life. <laughs> Certainly not going to look like the cover uh, right there. Uh, so one thing you can also do is he could, uh, instead of just picking berries, he could produce capital goods. Let's say a, a bow and arrow, right, to hunt animals, right? So he's, uh, he, he, he hunt boar, he can hunt deer, et cetera. Uh, this leads to greater consumption, right? We'd say the, the, the food is more nutritional. Uh, Robinson Crusoe, Crusoe is going to feel happier, et cetera. But it takes more time, right? Let's say it takes 30 hours. And this is, takes 30 hours to build this bow and arrow, right? I'm abstracting from the time it takes to actually hunt an animal and then to turn the animal into something edible. But just to build the bow and arrow is going to take 30 hours or something like that. All right, yeah. So uh, can Robinson Crusoe do this? Uh, well, fortunately, Crusoe uh, recovered a knife and twine from his ship. And even better, uh, before the ship crashed, he went on WikiHow uh, to find out how to make a bow and arrow. Uh, which is also what I did <laughs> for this PowerPoint. Uh, so he was like, oh, this is, this is great. I know how to make a bow and arrow now. Uh, I went on uh, you know, WikiHow, um, and you know, he has this technological knowledge. So in order to do so, there are three stages. He's, one, got to find the right wooden sticks, right? The, the, the right wood. It's got to be a certain length, a certain shape, durability, et cetera, to make, a, uh, to, to, to make the bow. He's also got to find the right sticks for arrows. This takes time. He's got to search around the forest. Uh, you know, on the island and et cetera. 
The, the second stage, he's got to use his knife to sharpen the wood in the sticks, right? So he's got to, he's got to start to bend the wood, and he's got to put notches in the wood, and then he's got to uh, smooth the sticks, make them into arrows, make them pointy, et cetera. And then the third stage is he's, uh, he's got to, you know, he has those notches. He might have to flush them out a little bit better, and then he's got to tie his uh, twine to the bow, right? And then, you know, voila, he's got his, his bow and arrow. Uh, it's taken him 30 hours, and he's off to the races, so to speak. He can, he can, he can now enjoy a uh, you know, much higher uh, level of consumption. So how can Caruso do this and not starve? Because remember, well, we said each day he's got to pick berries for 10 hours, right? Uh, but if he's spending 30 hours to make this bow and arrow, uh, well, he's got to eat in the, in the meantime, right? Well, in order to do so, in order to uh, not starve and create this capital good, he has to save. Right? He's got to restrict present consumption. He's got to uh, save a supply of berries each day. So for a couple days before this, he's got to uh, maybe get, uh, you know, he's got to get more berries than he's going to consume. So we can have a pile of berries that will last him for the 30 hours while he is making uh, his bow and arrow, his capital good, right? And he's also got to invest, right? He's got to construct the capital good, all right? Uh, when we talk about savings, this brings us into time preference. He has to postpone present satisfaction for a greater future satisfaction. Uh, we're going to get into that later when we, uh, Dr. Herbner discusses the theory of interest. So I'll just mention this now, right? Um, <clears throat> so, but at the end, for his restriction of present consumption, he's going to have a greater amount of future consumption. Okay, so every act of savings, every act of creating a capital good involves restricting uh, the consumption of consumer goods. If we think about my example in the banking talk, uh, when I set up the loan bank, I restricted my consumption by $10,000. I could have spent that $10,000 on a nice trip to the Bahamas. Instead, I said, no, I'm going to save, uh, run a loan bank, and then make more money uh, in the future that I can increase my consumption used to increase my consumption. All right. We can analyze uh, Crusoe's uh, situation more. And so after he builds his bow and arrow and he's, he's been hunting animals, things are going well, et cetera. He's getting, uh, he's getting plenty of food. Uh, it's not going to stop there, right? He obviously was used to a much higher standard of living before his ship crashed. Uh, Crusoe, he can continue to save berries as well as other goods needed uh, to further increase his future consumption, right? He can improve his bow, get a better uh, piece of wood. He can sharpen it more. He can add heads to the arrows. He can add feathers to the arrows so they, they, you know, they, they go better through the air and they can kill an animal more easily, et cetera. He could build a net and a spear to catch fish, right? So he could, he could, he could subsist off of a diet of, of deer in the morning and then fish at night. You know, he's, he's living like an aristocrat already, um, you know, et cetera. It's going better for him. Uh, he can build a hut, and so on, right? What we call capital widening, and again, this is really capital goods widening, this refers to creating more of the same capital good. So if Caruso is saving and he's investing by building more arrows, right? He's already got the arrows from before, but he's just building more of the same arrows, right? Or he's building multiple spears, something like that. Capital deepening, or capital goods deepening, is creating new kinds of capital goods, right? So he's building a net, he's building... A, uh, a better bow and arrow. Uh, he's building a complicated trap to catch animals, uh, you know, et cetera, something like that, right? Capital widening and capital deepening, they always take more time. They, they lengthen the period of production, right? Because if you want to make a better type of bow, well, if an inferior type of bow took 30 hours, the better type of bow is going to take 40 hours. And if you want to make multiple more arrows, right? If arrows, making 100 arrows is going to take 10 hours, well, then making 200 arrows is going to take 20 hours, et cetera. It always takes more time. They lengthen the period of production, right? Because to construct all the capital goods, it takes more time. And this adds, we would say, higher order stages to the structure, right? Because if we're making a better bow and arrow, you've got to add the extra stage of adding the heads to the arrows that requires searching for the right rock and sharpening the rocks and then getting feathers, Right, you know, feathers from animals, and then you got to add them on, and that's an additional step on WikiHow. I didn't, you know, have space for initially, so they're now the higher order stages, etc. Um, so, in other words, more productive processes, those that lead to greater increase in consumption, take more time. 
right? Because if you want to get a certain level of consumption, you could build the bow I mentioned before. If you want to get a greater level of consumption, you got to build the bow, you got to build a net and a spear, et cetera, right? This is what Bombavirk called roundabout production processes, okay? It's a little confusing because you would think, well, don't we actually want to take the shortest route to, some, to, to, to accomplish something uh, later in the day as we go out to dinner, right? The quickest way to get the dinner is to go to dinner is we go down the stairs right there and we walk right out, right? Uh, is, we could take a longer route and we could, we could go downstairs and we could walk around. We could do two laps around the building and then we could go get our dinner. We don't say that's more productive and that, that reasoning is absolutely true. It just so happens that in order to get a higher level of consumption, we have to use, we have to adopt processes that take more time. Okay, so not every longer production process is going to be more productive. It's just the ones that are productive take more time. Okay, so if we want to build a more complex capital structure, we have to forego more and more time. We have to forego more and more present consumption. Okay, so if Caruso is adding to his, his capital goods stock, he's accumulating more uh, berries, he's accumulating more, uh, more arrows, he's adding more uh, complicated net, he's building a hut, et cetera, we call this capital accumulation, or really capital goods accumulation, right? His stock of capital goods is increasing. On the other hand, let's say Crusoe said, eh, I'm not really going to repair my bow and arrow. I'm not going to uh, make that additional net. I'm just going to pick berries and just kind of uh, let the chips fall uh, where they may, etc. He's going to be consuming his capital goods. He's going to be engaging what's known as capital consumption. Okay. So if, you're, if actors are saving, they're engaging in capital accumulation. They're building more capital goods. If, if, if actors are uh, not saving, if they're, if they're decreasing their saving, they're going to be consuming their capital stock. Okay. So what do we learn from our simple Crusoe thought experiment? Okay. Uh, well, we learn that, um, again, from the simple example that we can now use to apply to more complicated examples, well, factors of production differ in terms of their specificity. Right? So certain sticks are going to be able to be used for bows and for arrows. Others will not. Certain pieces of wood will be able to use for a bow, et cetera. Certain rocks will be able to use to make a spear, right? If you want to make a spear, you're going to need different factors of production than if you want to make a net, okay? Right? We've also learned that the creation of capital goods requires savings, and it takes time. In order to construct capital goods, um, we, uh, we, we have to uh, forego uh, consuming in the present, right? We know that increases in future consumption require longer production processes, right? So if Caruso wants to, uh, you know, satisfy his end of, you know, just sleeping, uh, he's going to build a, you know, a fire, right? It's going to take uh, several hours. But if he wants to have an even greater, um, uh, you know, place where he can sleep, not just in the sand or someplace, he's got to build a house, you know, a hut that's going to take more time, uh, so on and so forth. And we, last but not least, we know that Crusoe's standard of living is based off of his, uh, is based on his, uh, his stock of uh, capital goods. Um, <clears throat> and uh, if Crusoe's standard of living is to go up, it requires uh, more and more capital goods. Okay, so now let's look at the modern economy. So this is a, when we talk about the modern economy, there's money, right? One person just isn't producing everything. There's not just Caruso. There's multiple people. There's tens of thousands of people, right? Hundreds of thousands of people. We're all specializing in different things, right? We're specializing at different stages uh, in the structure of production for different goods, okay? And there's also these individuals called capitalists that we will uh, talk about. Right. So with a uh, modern structure of production, there's multiple stages. It's much more complex and in-depth than uh, just a simple Crusoe example. So let's look at the iron and steel industry, right? So the first stage, you got to mine, uh, someone's got to mine ore, coal, and limestone out of the ground, right? You got to find it, right? There's a certain land factor, certain workers involved in that process, et cetera, certain tools to mine resources, the second stage is you got to take the ore into iron. It's got to be smelted into iron, right? The third stage is you've got to refine iron into steel, 
okay? The iron has to be uh, transformed into steel. Right. The fourth stage is you have to shape the steel into plates. Okay, so there's all, all sorts of capital goods involved in that. Uh, and then the fifth stage is you got to fabricate plates into railway cars. Right. And let's just stop there. Say the railway car is a consumer good. Uh, you know, you, someone just likes to buy a train uh, to live in or et cetera, or collect um, and so on. Right. So we see you've got the circulating capital. It's being transformed uh, through each stage and it's successively moving through each stage of production. OK. So the relevant factors of production, these, they all have uh, varying degrees of specificity. OK. Um, I'm going to see where I am here. Uh, so you want to have labor, right? Certain workers are going to be working at the foundry. Other workers are going to be making uh, the, 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 um, uh, the, 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 the railway car. Other workers are going to be mining resources out of the ground, right? Their skills due to their innate inequality as well as their relative experience, they're going to be more adapted to producing uh, certain uh, goods than others, right? You've got land. Right, where the ore is found, you know, is discovered, right? Certain places in the in the world have uh, the right resources; others do not. Uh, certain places are going to be advantageous for factories and plants. Back in the day, this was near some some river or some method of transportation where you could ship the produced goods to a later stage in the economy. You also have your fixed capital goods. Uh, these are the mining implements. Uh, the uh, blast furnace, the hammers, the tongs, et cetera, right? You've got the circulating capital. You've got the ore transformed into iron, the iron transformed into steel, the steel transformed into uh, a plate, and the plate transformed into a railway car, right? So at each stage of production, uh, factors of production are being combined, the original factors plus the fixed capital, transforming the circulating capital good into later stages, right? So again, some of these factors can be used in other lines of production, others cannot. So if the demand for railway cars uh, completely plummeted, so no one valued uh, railroad cars anymore, certain factors of production, they would still retain value because they could produce other goods. Workers uh, could switch, right? But the particular machinery used to make the railway car, that, that's the only thing they can do, the specific factors of production are going to lose all their value, right? So the more specific a factor of production is, the more specific a capital good is, the more its value is going to be tied in with the good it's directly producing, okay? So for me, all I know how to do is to give economics talks. If, if people stop valuing economics talks, I'd be... I'd be on the street. I'd be homeless. I'd have nothing else to do. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't work or do another job. On the other hand, well, I, I guess I could. I could do the modeling thing, right? Um, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, and, and, uh, at least I, uh, for, uh, for other economists, uh, we, we would, be, would be unemployed, let's say. All right. <laughs> uh, and then we can talk about advances in the capital structure. Uh, so you can think of widening, and this is building more blast furnaces, uh, in factory, so building more of the same capital good, right? Building more uh, machines that can mine iron ore uh, out of the ground, right? And you've got deepening. So this could be researching and development into new steel processes, adding an extra stage of production, doing something to the steel before it's converted into plates, something of that nature, right? Both of these are going to take more time, right? And both of them are going to add to our capital stock and uh, add to the amount of consumer goods that can be produced. Sorry. All right. Um, okay. So continuing on, uh, we we'll talk about the the capitalists now. So the, the, these factors of production, they're not just being move. You know, they're just moving through the structure of production automatically. There are individuals uh, involved. Right. Um, these are what we call capitalists. Right. And when you think of capitalist, you think of, oh, you, you greedy capitalist pig or, you, you know, you corporate fat cat or something. So you've got this picture of big business. You think of some guy like the Monopoly man. Uh, he's dressed like he's from the 19th century. He's got a monocle. He's got a bag of money, et cetera. And you think, well, he's just exploiting people. 
Right. Because the workers, he's not doing any, he's not doing any, uh, any work. The, 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 the people making the, uh, the steel, et cetera, they're the ones who are toiling. They're the ones who are engaging in the tough work. But the capitalist is there, and he's just, uh, he's just extracting money from them. Yeah. Uh, this is something the Marxists used to argue. But our friend uh, Eugen von Bomberwerk uh, thoroughly demolished this line of reasoning. Because right? this is what he said. He said, well, the capitalists, they're actually performing something that's indispensable. It's needed for production, right? Because at each stage of production, capitalists are restricting their present consumption. They are saving money, right? They could have used that money to buy consumer goods, right? But they're not. They're saving money and they're investing this money by purchasing factors of production, right? So the capitalist, uh, the, 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 um, uh, in the mining industry, uh, purchased the machines needed, uh, hired the workers, he bought the land, uh, that someone initially homesteaded, et cetera. And they're, they're advancing money to these factors of production while they're producing the good, while they're mining iron, uh, while, excuse me, while they're mining the ore out of the ground, right? And that ore is going to be a circulating capital good that can be later sold uh, down the next stage. So for this act of savings, he's not earning some sort of rate of exploitation like the Marxists would say. He's earning interest. He's, he's, this, is, this, is a, this is a valuable uh, function that he's performing. In the real world, which we'll learn more about later, uh, later in the week, he can also earn a profit uh, for his entrepreneurial judgment. This is in the world of uncertainty, right? We're just going to abstract from that. We're saying he's just earning a return, okay? Uh, so this return is, is really the savings is what keeps this whole process going. Because the, uh, the, the original factors, the workers, their time preferences are, are too high. They're not saving enough, right? The capitalist is not exploiting them, right? He's, he's performing a valuable service like, uh, like everyone else involved. So for example, let's say the State Street capitalist buys $1 million of iron and other factors, and uh, these factors transform the iron into steel. Then the capitalist sells the steel for $1.1 million, uh, the capitalist earns a 10% interest return, okay? We don't say, oh, well, if the capitalist wasn't there, then the workers could get that extra 10%. Uh, it's faulty economic reasoning because if the capitalist wasn't there, the workers, th there wouldn't be that product that could be sold for $1.1 million, okay? So the capitalist is, is you know, is, is not... Uh, well, he, he, you know, they might look like that, but they're not, they're not, it's the same sort of nefarious uh, function that your average person thinks, thinks, all right? The capitalist is extremely important. They're indispensable for the structure of production. Okay, so we can move from the structure of production for a sandwich or for a bow and arrow to um, you know, iron and steel, and then we can go to the overall economy, okay? So we, the structure of production can be depicted with the same sort of series of stages each with their own specific and non-specific uh, factors of production, okay? So the first stage is mining or harvesting some sort of raw materials, right? Harvesting wheat, right, from the ground that has to be grown. Second stage is refining these raw materials, right? Say you are, someone's got to thresh the wheat, the miller uh, has to thresh the, the, the wheat and, and, and turn it into flour, okay? In the third stage, uh, it's manufacturing, uh, the, uh, the baker is going to take the flour and make some form of bread, right? Fourth stage is, is packaging and distributing the goods. So the wholesaler is going to add some shrink wrap or some seasoning and, uh, you know, get everything, put the nutritional facts on it and all that stuff. And then the fifth stage is selling it to consumer goods, right? So you've got the finished bread. Start off from wheat, you go to bread, okay? So um, with this longer structure of production or this more complex structure of production, right, what do we know? What do we know aside from now we know how to make bread uh, from the ground? Uh, you know, starting from the basic raw materials is that, um, you know, again, there's still the same higher order goods turned into low order goods, turned into consumer goods. When we're looking at the aggregate economy, we can def sort of redefine lower orders as those production processes that produce consumer goods in the near future and the higher orders as those production processes that produce goods in the remote future. Right, so the the wheat harvested uh, out of the ground is going to produce bread at a later date than bread at the wholesaler right now. Okay, now it's important to note when we look at this, we're considering the aggregate. It's it, it, it's the production processes for each good can take various uh, lengths. 
right? So the, the, the time it takes to build a, a railroad car is going to take longer than the time it takes to uh, make bread, right? So when we're trying to analyze the economy, uh, sort of split up the higher orders and the lower orders, we, uh, we uh, the production for an overall, you know, for a good might be considered the lower orders, uh, while production for another good would be the higher orders. So the textile industry or making clothes could be considered lower orders, whereas uh, more uh, intensive projects like making railroads or something involved with technology are the higher orders. I mentioned this point because a lot of economists will say, well, this entire higher order, lower order structure production analysis is all nonsense because goods can be used in multiple stages or there's no way of, 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 of distinguishing it empirically, et cetera, and we got to scrap it all. And that, that view is wrong. Uh, you can empirically distinguish, yeah, that's wrong. Yeah. You can empirically distinguish between, uh, or at least conceptually, the higher order and the lower orders, and you can do so as well. Again, just, calculating the overall time it takes to transform the raw materials into a consumer good, all right? Well, you've got this overall structure of production with multiple stages, right? Goods are being produced, capitalists are saving at each stage, et cetera. They're advancing the produced good further down the line and so on. So we can show this using the Hayekian triangle. So F.A. Hayek, uh, he's a noted Austrian economist uh, and he built off of Bomberwerk. So Bamba Verk showed this structure of production using circles. So the series of concentric circles, right, where the earlier stages were the circle in between. And as we, we moved farther and farther, the, the, the rings, it's like the ring, the layers of an onion, et cetera. Hayek said, well, it's kind of confusing. Let's just, let's just use a triangle or a trapezoid to show this. It's really, it's really a trapezoid uh, than, than a triangle. In we can now graphically show the process I was just mentioning, where at the earlier stages of production, say the, the capitalists in the mining industry, they're purchasing the original factors, let's say for $8, right? Uh, so they're purchasing original factors and they're producing a good, uh, the, the ore that can be sold for $8, right? That's sold to the capitalist in the second stage uh, involved in uh, refining, right? Uh, where then it'll purchase New original factors, land and labor, he'll purchase the circulating capital for $8, and then he'll sell the refined product uh, for $16, okay? And we move further and further down the, uh, the list where uh, the manufacturer is purchasing the goods from the refiner, the wholesaler is purchasing the goods from the manufacturer, until finally the retailer is purchasing goods from the wholesaler for $32, and then he is selling uh, the consumer goods to the consumer for $40, right, at each stage of production. So if you've, uh, if you've ever looked at Roger Garrison's um, time and money, uh, he takes the triangle, his big innovation is he, he goes like this, he flips it, Right, and then it becomes a triangle. Um, I like to use the the, the old the, the the old school diagrams uh, where, where you can where you can clearly see the stages, right? And as Austrian economists, we, we can now use this. This is our like our model of the entire economy. It's not an aggregate like Keynesian economics. It's really like a halfway house between an intermediate stage between the microeconomics and the macroeconomics. This is our bridge. Right, where we're going to move beyond the individual actor to the economy uh, at large. Okay. What are, we, uh, what are we going to use this diagram for? Well, we're going to use this diagram to show what happens when you have increases in savings. I can only briefly go through this now because you, you have to understand uh, the economics of interest rates. But it's the same basic analysis. It's going to, just like in the Crusoe uh, economy, capital accumulation is going to lead to capital widening and capital deepening. And both of these are going to increase stages. Right? They're going to create additional stages in the overall structure of production, and they're going to lengthen it. They're going to make the structure of production more roundabout. Right? And then we know that when you have more capital goods, this is going to lead to more consumer goods, and standards of living will go up. So the economy actors in the economy will become wealthier when they save, right? And we can see from this diagram here, uh, an additional uh, two stages was created, right? We don't need to go through the debate, you know, the, 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 the intricate numbers involved there. All we can just see is that the structure production is lengthening and it's becoming more roundabout, all right? It's important to note from this example, and Austrians emphasize this, is that technology 
the technological knowledge is actually somewhat secondary in this process. And it might sound counterintuitive because you say, well, wait a second, with better technology, we'll be able to make better goods, right? which is absolutely true. But in order to make those goods, we need not only the knowledge, but we also need the saved resources. Right? If you have uh, the knowledge of how to build a jetpack, right? The jetpack isn't just going to be magically created. You have to have the right resources, right? It could be uneconomical. It could be not profitable for our capitalists to make the jetpack, right? which is why it wouldn't be made. So Austrians would emphasize the way developing economies become rich is not just simply technological knowledge, right? They know how to make things that first world countries can make, but it, they need the savings. They need uh, the time preferences that are going to provide enough savings uh, in the resources um, uh, to, to forego consum the foregoing consumption to release those resources so they can be used to make those goods. Okay, it's very important to know. Okay, so we've discussed Austrian capital economics. How does this, how does this Austrian capital theory differ from the standard neoclassical capital theory? Right. Well, capital goods, the Austrians emphasize are heterogeneous. Right? They're different. Right? They're not homogeneous. They're not all the same. The structure of production is a lattice work, or it's this intricate network of capital goods. It all kind of fits together like a puzzle. Right? As, we, as circulating capitals move through the structure of production, each you know, hammer and tong and, and, all, and all the workers and the land, et cetera, they, they all play their part. Some of them you can shift around, others of them you can't. So they're all like quasi-imperfect puzzle pieces. Okay. Mainstream economics sort of totally ignores this. In their models, there's really just one capital good. Right? They lump it all together. They just sort of treat capital goods like they're clay. Okay. So it's just it's like it's like silly putty. Austrians treat capital goods like Legos. All right. Neoclassicals treat capital goods like like silly putty. Right. Or it's just it's all the same. Right. So there can never be any distortions in the capital goods market because they're all just, it's all just silly putty, right? Um, Austrians also argue that time plays a crucial part of any production process, right? Neoclassical economics abstracts from time. They actually ignore time. They say, well, time's unimportant in production, right? And their rationale is that, well, in general equilibrium in this never-never land world of production, production is actually instantaneous. You say, well, that, isn't that, well, that, that's odd. And the, the way they argue this is they say, well, suppose you're looking at a forest, right? And uh, on one side of the forest, someone's chopping down uh, trees. And on the other side, someone's planting seeds. And since this is happening in each state, you know, at each time period in the structure of production, well, plant seeds uh, at time, uh, you know, T, you're harvesting trees at time T. See, production's instantaneous, right? Uh, this is the totally uh, incorrect view. Right? It's not the same tree that's being planted and harvested. Right? It's, 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 there's a structure, but neoclassical economics just, just totally abstracts from that. Right? Uh, it's a very important uh, uh, point to make. Right? Something uh, Bomba Verk uh, got into a lot of arguments with uh, some prominent economists in his time. And then lastly, as I mentioned, he said savings is the most important uh, ingredient for economic growth. Uh, this is different than neoclassical economics, which champions technology more, right? And neoclassical economics can even say, well, savings is bad, right? And if people are spending their savings, that's good, right? We kind of hear this now, or you hear, oh, why is the economy recovering? Well, everyone's got all these pent up savings, and it's just like, and, you know, they just spend it, and then like it stimulated the economy. Oh, it's all the savings. That that was the reason why the economy crashed. Oh, right, that was that was the culprit, right? Blame the saver. No, that's it's, it's totally false. Okay. Uh, the argument, the Keynesian argument that savings can decrease growth is known as the paradox of thrift, right? uh, which is incorrect. Right. So for the future, all right, we want to understand the importance of time preference and interest rates. Okay, so I've mentioned savings, but we want to see how time preference factors into this, uh, specifically how interest rates factor into this. We also want to look at how changes in interest rates affect the present value of long-term production processes relative to short-term production processes. So if the interest rate falls or rises, how is that going to affect the value or the profitability of embarking upon higher order production relative to lower order production? As I mentioned in the banking course, uh, we also want to look at how do changes in time preference and credit expansion affect the structure of production, right? 
Uh, unfortunately, the answers to these questions, you're going to have to learn them tomorrow, right? In Dr. Herbner and Dr. Jonathan Newman's classes, hopefully you can wait, right? Hopefully you can forego the present consumption necessary, right? Um, so for more, I encourage you to read Mark Skousen's The Structure of Production, Roger Garrison's Time and Money, Huerta de Soto's Money, Bank, Credit, and Economic Cycles. Uh, these are all great books on Austrian capital theory. I highly encourage you to read them if you're interested in the, uh, in the topic. And uh, if you're sick of me, too bad. Uh, at least I'm, I, was, was, uh, I think I'm on the panel, so you know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, I think we're going to take a little break. <laughs> <laughs>